muted. HR and client services team. Um, today's webinar is going to be on conflict resolution and consensus building. I do have everyone on mute just to keep the line quiet, but if you have questions as we're going through the webinar, you can type them into the question box on your screen. And I'm going to go ahead and start the webinar now. Today we're going to talk about resolving workplace conflict and building consensus. Workplace conflict may be based on disagreements over work procedures, different needs and interests, clashes of personalities, or a range of other situations and circumstances that lead to confrontations among employees. Management experts estimate that most supervisors and managers spend as much as a quarter or more of their time managing conflicts. When you know how to resolve workplace conflicts effectively, you can save time and turn potentially destructive situations into positive, produ productive opportunities for growth and development within your work group. The main objective of today's session is to help you manage conflict and build consens consensus among employees successfully. By the time this session is over, you should be able to recognize the impact of workplace conflict, identify common causes for conflict, Understand how positive communication helps prevent conflict, resolve conflict successfully, and build consensus among employees. So let's just start out about defining or talking about defining conflict and what conflict is. Conflict is a disagreement, it's a dispute with others, and it generally involves the clash of interests, ideas, or personalities. It's important to realize that conflict is inevitable. Whenever and wherever people work or live together, there are going to be occasional disagreements. That's because conflict is a normal part of human life. People have different personalities, points of view, ideas, needs, and so forth, and those differences sometimes clash, and that leads to conflict. Conflict can arise within groups or between individuals. Conflict can be professional and focus on work issues, or it can be personal and arise out of the interaction of different personalities. It's also important to realize that conflict is not necessarily destructive. It can be productive and lead to improved relationships or innovative ideas. It all just depends on how you deal with it. And all conflicts can be resolved if you manage them properly. So as we go through this webinar, think about conflicts you've dealt with among your employees, what started those conflicts, how you resolved them, and how you could apply some of these techniques in the future. When workplace conflict is well managed, it can have constructive outcomes. Well managed conflict can spark creativity and challenge employees to think about what they're doing and how they might improve methods and procedures. When employees disagree about how things should be done, the debate can lead to better products and services for customers, and that can make for a more successful and competitive organization. In an atmosphere that acknowledges and manages conflict effectively, healthy competition among employees can exist without becoming destructive. And in such an atmosphere, diversity can also flourish, and employees from different backgrounds can present and promote their ideas all points of view can be heard and appreciated. Think about these potential benefits of constructive conflict and how they can benefit your department or organization. When workplace man conflict is not well managed, however, it's likely to have a destructive influence. Poorly managed conflict can lead employees to um, reduced productivity, lower morale, increased absenteeism as employees seek to avoid a hostile or uncomfortable work environment, greater turnover as employees leave to find or jobs and organizations where conflict is better managed, uh, also the wildfire effect with one conflict leading to others and spreading out of control within groups and between departments, and also an increased potential for violence. There are numerous causes for workplace conflict, and we'll go through a few of those here. So first, poor communication inevitably leads to misunderstandings, and misunderstandings often lead to conflict. Employees with dissimilar work styles may come into conflict when they have to work together, 
Each one thinks that his or her way is right or best. And as in every other aspect of life, people with different personalities sometimes clash on the job as well. Different goals can also lead to workplace conflict. Some employees may think that their work objectives are more important than those of their coworkers, or they may believe that their goals deserve priority, or they might simply not understand their coworkers' goals. Some other causes of conflict. Um, conflict can often arise out of uh, other differences as well. For example, different needs may, be, may lead employees to compete for resources, recognition, raises, promotions, and so forth, and this can often lead to conflict. Conflicts may arise among employees with different functions as well, where job functions overlap or come into contact, territorial disputes can arise, um, or competing interests may conflict. Employees may have different perceptions of situations, policies, and so forth, and these differing viewpoints can lead to disagreements about what should be done and how it should be done. And employees also respond differently to pressure. For example, the pressure to perform, the pressure to uh, achieve results, pressure to meet demanding schedules, and so on. These pressures can often bring employees together in confrontational situations. <clears throat> So in any workplace conflict, you and your employees basically have five options. First, you can try to avoid the issue and hope it goes away, which it rarely does. It usually only gets worse. Another option is for one person or group to surrender to another and give in to what the winner wants. Employees can compete with one another to see who dominates, but this usually ends up in a win-lose situation, which can lead to renewed conflict at a later time. Alternatively, you can get employees to negotiate a compromise which e with each side giving up some of what it wants to make peace. Or you can encourage employees to collaborate, working together to develop a mutually agreeable result, in other words, a win-win solution. As you can imagine, this is generally the most productive way to deal with conflict. When those in conflict can't collaborate to develop a mutually beneficial solution to their conflict, compromise can be a good fallback. None of the other options, however, are effective if your goal is to manage workplace conflict effectively. Evasion, surrender, or competition inevitably lead to renewed conflict down the line. When you're faced with a workplace conflict, review this conflict assessment checklist before you take further action. First, determine who's involved in the conflict. It might involve more people than you think. It might involve people from different parts of the organization. Just to find out how extensive the conflict is. And then what are the circumstances? Is there an underlying power struggle between departments? Is there a diversity issue underlying the conflict? Or is there a professional difference of opinion at the core of the disagreement? Why is this particular conflict occurring? Think about the common causes of workplace conflict that we just discussed, and that can help you figure out the why of the issue. And finally, think about whether there's a policy that covers the um, situation. Organizational policies can sometimes help you resolve conflicts because they often address the areas of potential conflict and how to deal with them. You also want to ask yourself whether you should intervene in the conflict. Sometimes it may be better to let employees work things out on their own if you think there's a good chance that they can. What would the consequences be of not intervening? If failure to act might lead to destructive conflict or fuel other conflicts, then you must intervene. Who can you consult and ask for advice? Perhaps your boss can help, or maybe you have a colleague whose judgment you trust on these issues. If you're in any doubt about how to proceed, talk the matter over with someone that has experience handling conflict successfully. Um, and I'll just give us a plug. Your HR consultant at Resourcing Edge can probably help you with this because we're all trained in conflict resolution. And then finally, ask yourself what a good resolution of this conflict would look like. Is it possible to cre cre create a win-win um, solution, and how would you do that? One of the best ways to minimize the chance of destructive conflict in your department or work group is to teach your employees to communicate more effectively. Good communication begins with sending clear messages, and I'll give you some helpful strategies that you can teach your employees. 
First, take the time to sort out exactly what you want to say. Know your thoughts and feelings on the subject. When speaking, use first-person statements such as I think, I believe, I need, etc. as a way to take full responsibility for your position. Avoid finger pointing such as you always do this or you never do that. And if you have to deliver a difficult message, before you speak to the person who needs to hear your message, make notes or talk into a tape recorder or in front of a mirror even, or you can discuss the issue with someone who can be objective. That way you'll be sure that it comes out right when you say it. <clears throat> Another area to coach employees on is listening. Workplace conflicts often arise because people fail to listen to each other and really hear what the other one has to say. So here are some strategies for better listening that you can teach to your employees as well. Don't interrupt. Give the others time to say what they need to say. Pay attention and avoid distractions when another person is talking to you. And make sure you're not just sitting there pretending to listen while you're really preparing your comeback. Be open and receptive. Don't jump to conclusions or make assumptions. Stay focused on the issues and not personalities. Also, look at the person who's speaking to you to catch all the nonverbal cues. For example, gestures, tone of voice, body posture, and facial expressions. Show by your own eye contact and body posture and gestures that you're listening and following what the other person has to say. Use your imagination to try and put yourself in the other person's position and understand his or her point of view. And then also ask questions to clarify points you don't understand. Be careful not to interrogate, though, and hold your questions until the person is finished speaking. And then finally, restate what a person has said to make sure you understand and that you both agree on what was said. It's really important for employees to learn good communication skills because it makes for a more productive work environment and it also helps prevent conflict. So now we'll take a look at a simple eight-step conflict resolution process that you and your employees can view or can use to resolve any type of workplace conflict. Step one is to call a meeting with all of the individuals involved in the conflict. Make sure that you get everyone that's involved. Um, if you leave anyone out, the conflict can't be effectively and permanently resolved. Step two is to establish discussion rules. For example, the goal of this meeting is to find a mutually acceptable solution or it's okay to express thoughts and feelings openly as long as you're respectful to one another. Just lay some ground rules down about how the meeting is going to go. And then step three is to define the problem clearly in terms of needs. Each party to the conflict must have an opportunity to find their needs in terms that the others can understand. And this can take time and it can take patience. Um, the key to resolving conflict often comes when people recognize what they actually need as distinct from merely what they would like. Step four is to develop possible solutions that will meet, meet the needs of both or all the parties involved in the conflict. You may have to get the ball rolling by making suggestions of your own, but once the employees are talking, let them offer their ideas. Show your openness to employees' suggestions by not evaluating ideas immediately. Step five is to select a mutually beneficial solution from among those suggested. Remember, the best solution, a lasting solution, is one that meets the needs of each party as far as possible. Try not to impose a solution, but rather guide the employees involved to make the best choice for themselves. Step six is to develop an action plan, who will do what, by when, and how to implement the resolution of the conflict. This is a vital step. Without it, conflict could easily flare up again. Step seven is to implement that plan and monitor the plan in action. Don't just walk away thinking the plan will work. You want to check back in and make sure that it actually does. And then step eight is to evaluate the conflict resolution process in general and the resolution of this conflict specifically. Did the process yield an effective result? Um, were employees involved satisfied with the resolution? Will your efforts help eliminate or at least minimize this type of conflict in the future? Those are all important questions to ask. 
Now we'll look at a couple of special circumstances. Recurring conflicts are particularly difficult to handle. They often involve a number of employees and some deep and bitter feelings. Such conflicts involve patterns of behavior that may have been going on for a long time, perhaps even before you came on the scene. And open conflict flares up from time to time, and then things calm down again. But the basic reason for conflict is never really resolved. Recurring conflicts can be really destructive and really have to be dealt with once and for all. Your first step in uh, when you encounter recurring conflict is to identify all of the participants. Often these wars involve a number of employees, and you need to identify the foot soldiers as well as the leaders on both sides. Speak to each employee individually and try to find out exactly what the conflict is about from each person's perspective. You'll likely gain a lot of interesting information this way. When employees involved have been interviewed separately, bring them all together to discuss the problem. Encourage all to say exactly what's on their minds, but require them to be professional and respectful in the way that they express their thoughts and feelings. Summarize your understanding of the underlying conflict and ask employees to correct you if you've mis misinterpreted anything. Next, talk about how employees can recognize signs that conflict might be about to break out again. By recognizing these signs, they can take step steps to break the cycle of conflict. Talk about how this might be done. For example, they can use the eight-step conflict resolution process that we discussed earlier. And if they're not already familiar with that process, you can teach it to them and practice it with them. And then finally, monitor the situation closely until you're convinced that the cycle truly has been broken and the pattern of conflict has been changed to one of discussion of issues and working through problems and cooperation. Personality conflicts are another special case, and these conflicts can be especially difficult to resolve. This type of conflict often becomes more emotional than rational. The work issues the employees claim to be fighting about usually have little or nothing to do with the actual cause of the conflict. Keep these special considerations in mind when you're trying to resolve a personality conflict between employees. First, make sure both employees understand that they're valuable to you, to their coworkers, and the organization. This is a critical first step, and it helps build self-esteem, and it enhances the ability of both employees to address their problems in a pro positive and professional way. Next, explain how the conflict is affecting work, the employee's performance, other employees, the department's productivity, and so forth. Try to de-emotionalize the issues and appeal to their sense of professionalism and pride in their jobs. And give them the chance to work things out and come up with a mutually acceptable resolution to their conflict. You can either let them do this privately if you think they can work things out without coming to blows, um, or you can mediate and help them work through the difficult issues. Once a solution is agreed upon, get a firm commitment from both employees that they will adhere to the agreement and try to get along better in the future. In some cases, the most realistic solution is simply to acknowledge that the employees will agree to disagree, but that they'll treat each other professionally and respectfully. Then monitor the situation closely for a while until you're convinced that the employees are working together without conflict. And if the solution should fail, Take necessary action to ensure that future conflict doesn't negatively affect other workers and your department. In the worst cases, this could involve a transfer for one or both of the employees, um, progressive discipline, or sometimes even termination if no other possibilities exist to restore peace to the workplace. Think about some of the personality conflicts between employees that you've had to deal with and how you resolve those problems, and what you could do in the future to improve the process. Now we'll take a look at the other side of the coin, which is teaching and encouraging employees to seek agreement instead of resorting to conflict. Consensus is general agreement. It reflects group solidarity in thinking and or feeling on an issue. 
consensus building is the workplace process by which sincerely held core agreement is reached among a group of employees. In order to be effective, it must be inclusive and acknowledge the views of all members of the group. It usually requires skillful facilitation by a leader. Normally, that's you, the supervisor, or manager. And unfortunately, consensus can be reached only for specific decisions. It can't be created once and for all as a general climate of agreement. So you may have to go through the process repeatedly for different issues. And a successful experience with consensus building can enhance overall motivation and teamwork. And it also can create an atmosphere where um, agreement generally pre prevails over conflict. So employees will start naturally gravitating in that direction rather than going towards conflict. There are five basic building blocks for consensus building. First, clearly define the issue around which you're seeking consensus. It's essential to make sure that everyone is focused on the same issue. Next, you'll establish ground rules for the discussion on the issue, just like we talked about earlier. Uh, and the purpose of these rules is to make sure that all points of view are vo voiced and thoroughly considered. You want to per or encourage 100% participation and discourage premature criticism or domination of the discussion by a few. The most effective rules are developed by the group itself under your leadership. Then get the honest views of all members of the group. Be sure not to take silence as agreement. Draw out the views of people who are quiet or previously critical. At this point, you should be ready to reach an agreement. In other words, seek consensus. Don't accept agreement too quickly, though. Make sure that people are agreeing for the right reasons and not because they feel pressure or just want to get it over with. Finally, create a statement summarizing the decision made by the group. Each member should be able to recognize a key point that was important to him or her in the final statement. This recognition strengthens commitment, and it confirms acceptance of the decision by everyone involved. And now we'll talk about some common mistakes that supervisors and managers make when trying to build consensus among employees. First, failing to clearly define the issue to be agreed upon can lead to lack of focus, a uh, waste of time, and a flawed result. And then not establishing fair and effective ground rules for discussion can also waste a lot of time, and it can damage the integrity of the process. Failing to include all points of view in the final statement is also fatal to the consensus building process. Remember that each group member must be committed to the result. Bargaining with or dissenters doesn't create consensus. That's negotiation and compromise, and it's another process completely. Remember that consensus is general agreement reflecting solidarity among the group. Be patient and keep working until you've got a true agreement between everyone involved. And finally, pushing your own ideas too much can lead to a result where there's no true agreement just a lot of nodding heads who are agreeing under what they may view as pressure from above. So make sure that you actually are letting them come to their own agreement. And you can guide, kind of guide them, but um, the, the group really needs to come up with the ideas together. So um, a few key points to remember from this webinar. First, workplace conflict is inevitable and normal. It doesn't have to be destructive. By effectively managing conflict, you can create a positive, productive atmosphere that encourages discussion and allows for diverse views to be heard. Building consensus can lead to genuine agreement and commitment to group success. And that is the conclusion of our conflict resolution and consensus building training session. I'm going to open up the question box in case anyone has questions or if there's a specific situation that you've had to deal with uh, and you have questions about that or the consensus building process or anything like that. And we'll leave the webinar open for about another five minutes for questions.
I don't have any questions yet, but we'll wait a few more minutes here and see if any anyone has anything to add. Okay, so our first question is, how do you handle conflict with a subordinate that you've built a friendship with? And this is a really tough one because it, it gets into that area of personality conflict and also, I guess, a little bit more complicated than that. So um, I've actually been in that situation where I was a supervisor and my assistant was a good friend of mine and unfortunately she wasn't doing a very good job. This is in a way past life. But um, the way I think the best way to handle it is to sit down with the person, talk to them openly and honestly, but in a professional environment. You don't want to do this over drinks or you know at someone's house or at lunch. Bring them into your office or you know a private space where you can talk to them. Explain your position. Uh, basically, you know, I'm your supervisor. It's my job to monitor and make sure you're doing a good job. And this has nothing to do with our friendship. I, you know, I still care about you. And whatever you need to say to reassure them that you still are their friend, but you also have a job to do. And then just be careful about the way you go about approaching the issue. Um, be open and honest, like I said. Be straightforward with them, but be sensitive too, so that you're not, you know, ruining that relationship. Um, most people are pretty reasonable, and they'll understand your position. And if you come at it from that perspective, where it's a supervisor talking to a subordinate, then they have to understand the position that you're in, and um, hopefully, you can come up with a mutually agreeable solution. Um, whether that be an action plan or a resolution to whatever the issue is. Hopefully that answered the question. And the next question is, how often do you recommend team building sessions? Well, team building sessions to me can be anything from a team going out to lunch to a team doing a webinar together or actually calling in a company that does team building or have one of us from Resourcing Edge app come out and do a team building with your group. So I think um, for, for regular team building where you're eating a meal together or you're having a, an informal meal to, or informal meeting together, I would probably do that about once a month, every other month just so that people can see each other's faces outside of um, while you're at your desk and really connect with one another. And then as far as formal team building sessions, I always recommend that you do those once or twice a year just to refresh any um, skills that you've learned before, bring new members into the group, and bring the group closer together. The next question is, what should you do when the conflict gets violent? So unfortunately, I've also dealt with that situation. I've been in HR for a long time. And when a situation gets violent, depending on um, you know, how, who's around, what's going on, um, if the situation can be de-escalated, if you can de-escalate it yourself without you know, getting in between people who are throwing blows at each other, then try to de-escalate it. Send both employees home really without another word. I would just send them both home you, until you know, people can calm down. And then later, you can call them both. Call them in for a meeting. You probably want to talk to them individually first just to make sure that they're calm. Find out what the issue is and why it came to that. And then if it's appropriate, you can um, bring them in together for a meeting. If it's not appropriate, a, a lot of times if there's violence involved, then one or both parties are going to be terminated. So at that point, definitely get your HRC, your human resources consultant involved. Let them know what happened. Um, and let us help you come up with a good solution to the issue. If 
there is immediate danger or an immediate threat to you or another employee or anyone else around, you should always call 911. Don't take a chance that someone be, could become seriously injured or that you, you know there's a threat to your employees or your business. Uh, always play it safe, and if it is an emergency situation, call 911. Our next con or our next question about conflict is, when do you end conflict by discharging one or more of the people involved? That often involves an investigation. So if there's a conflict going on and it can't be resolved through normal means, or if one employee is saying, you know, this other employee did something horrible to me, I always recommend an investigation and your human resources consultant can help you with that. They will interview everyone involved, try and get the full story, and just understand the facts of the situation. And then if there is something illegal going on, like harassment or discrimination, then your HR consultant will recommend that you term the person. Usually, conflicts can be resolved. Uh, if they've escalated that far, they can be resolved with a warning. But you know, in certain circumstances, you do have to terminate employment, and you just have to take the company policies and any uh, applicable laws into account while you're considering that. Next question is, what can you do if the person doesn't want to take any responsibility in the matter? Um, again, investigation. So if, if one person is denying everything, you can um, do an investigation and your human resources consultant or your investigation person, your investigator, will, will assign responsibility. They will make recommendations based on the facts that they've learned and what they believe and they'll say this is what I believe happened, this is who I believe is at fault, and these are the recommended actions to take. So at that point, you as the manager or owner of the business will review the investigative report and, and decide which way you want to go with it. But we'll always make recommendations for you and, and really try to figure out what the root of the problem is. And, and so in that case, it doesn't matter if the employee wants to take responsibility or not, you're going to assign responsibility to resolve the issue. And the last question is from our internal uh, favorite jokester, Dave Tuil, and he says, will the party get unemployment? Ha ha, just kidding. So, <laughs> but I'm going to answer that question anyway, Dave. So the, whether or not someone gets unemployment is not up to us and it's not up to you. It's up to the state and the circumstances of the situation. If someone's terminated and you've followed your internal processes and procedures, you've given them an oral warning, a written warning, a final written warning, and then moved on to termination, and you've crossed all your T's and dotted all your I's, generally the person won't get an unemployment but it's not up to us, it's up to the state. And the state, most states say you have to have lost your position through no fault of your own to be eligible for unemployment. So that's the answer to that. And I think with that, we will conclude today's webinar. I thank you all for attending, and stay tuned with us throughout the year. We're going to have a lot of great webinars for supervisors and managers on different HR and payroll topics and different safety topics, and pretty much everything that you need to know uh, we will cover it, and if you don't see a webinar that you would like or if there's some extra training that you would like, please let us know, and um, we'd be happy to provide it for you. So thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.